Okay, good evening. So another question tonight. Tonight we are looking at the topic of suicide. Someone asking for help. asking for help and they are having thoughts of suicide and they don't know where to turn. So um, I have two things to say about suicide. I'm going to structure this talk. shouldn't be that long, but what I will say, I'll say two different things. And then in each of those I have a few things to say. So the first thing to say about suicide is it doesn't fix the problem. Yeah. People commit suicide because they believe that it's going to end suffering. It's going to fix the problem. The problem is suffering. And this is a generalization. Uh, this video I don't think is going to be applicable to all forms of suicide. Obviously there's many different reasons. But a common one, probably the most common, I think, there's suffering. And that's general, so it covers a lot of types of suicide or reasons for committing suicide. Suicide is something that we think will fix the problem. And so from a, um, from a Buddhist perspective, I think it's not hard to guess where I'm going to go with this. Right? The, the very simple answer to um, why suicide doesn't fix the problem it does. The problem doesn't fix the problem it intends to or it seeks to, uh, is because death isn't, isn't the end. Right? That's a basic Buddhist tenet. tenet. But there's something mu more important to say than that. Um, something that's much more important than simply the fact that well, suicide doesn't end your problems, right? If we say, okay, uh, everyone, when they die, they're reborn again. If you haven't become a perfectly, uh, become a fully enlightened being, you're going to be reborn again. So, yes, it didn't fix your problem because you thought, well, uh, the the fix is going to be not living. No, surprise, you've got to live again, right? But no, it's much worse than that. And the real problem with suicide isn't simply that you have to be reborn again. In that case, it would actually make a lot of sense still, right? If you have a debilitating illness, if you're in great suffering, you think, well, I'll just hit the reset button. It's like when you call the, um, call the computer repair person something's wrong with your router, something's wrong with your machine, what do they tell you? <laughs> Try turning it off and on again. And just do that, and that will fix your problems. Seems reasonable. I think a lot of people commit suicide um, even, even with that sense. You, know, you hear about Buddhists who commit suicide with that sense. But uh, it's highly problematic in I would say almost all cases. At the end, I'll, I think at the end I'll talk about one interesting case. Um, yeah, maybe I'll talk about it in this section. Anyway, three reasons, three factors, three points to make about why suicide is, is especially problematic and a bad idea if you're trying to end suffering. 
The first is that, of course, suicide itself is a, a negative act. It's based on a negative perspective, and again, we're generalizing, but generally speaking, suicide is, uh, is thought of, is, is considered uh, from a perspective of, of negativity, you know, disliking, aversion is the root mental factor, patigha. You don't like something, or you're afraid of something. And so, engaging and um, accepting, um, affirming that quality of mind uh, is has a defiling quality. Right? It it it. it, it it, it increases in the impurity in the mind. It leads to uh, increased corruption in the mind. Meaning, the time we take to consider, to work ourselves up to killing ourselves is um, the acceptance and aligning ourselves with negative mind states, with corrupt mind states, with, with mind states that are averse to things. Now aversion, if you're not familiar, it's a big problem in Buddhism because um, it, it, it's, un, it's an unpleasant reaction to an experience. And by encouraging it, by, by augmenting it, by, by reaffirming it, right, you become more averse to the object uh, that you don't like, meaning the next time it comes, and, and every time it comes, you, in, you, you become increasingly averse to it. It's why headaches can become debilitating. At first it's a headache, second time you get it. When you have chronic headaches, it can become something that as soon as the slightest pain comes, you've, you're, you're moaning and, and rolling on the floor, or can't get out of bed and that sort of thing. Not because of the pain actually, but because of your built up aversion to it. Now that goes with everything. Building up aversion, building up desire, building up arrogance, conceit, all these things. They're habit forming. And so you're forming a habit when you do this. The second point is that suicide itself as an act, when you actually go through with it, is uh, destabilizing. Right? It's unnatural. It's violent. Uh, no matter how sort of peaceful you might make it, there are ways now, even in Ontario, Canada, where I'm from, apparently you can you can actually take an injection, you fall asleep and so on. But it's violent, uh, even if done sort of uh, peacefully, because it's a disruption. You know, there are two ways to die, and they are distinct. One is your life force is cut off by suicide, murder, an accident, that sort of thing. And the other is you come to an end of your your uh, life force, sort of your karma, the karma of being born, the, the, the cause of whatever it was that led you to be, to be born uh, has worn, its way, worn itself out. And when that does, you die. And that's quite natural. And, and you find, you hear about people in hospices who die this way, maybe in pain, maybe not, but they die naturally, and there's sort of a closure involved. Now, suicide doesn't give you that. Suicide is a disruption, an artificial death. And so it's disruptive, it's, it, it's destabilizing. And the, the result of both of these, the third factor, is that not only are you reborn again, but because of the way that you've left this world, the way that you've left this life, you're much more likely to be reborn in a bad place, to be reborn to, to, to continue on in a bad way. You know, whatever comes to you in the future is probably not going to be favorable. Why? Because you've spent time and energy cultivating uh, your, your aversion and, and delusion usually, because there's usually a belief that there's nothing else. So you, you create this view 
you know, that you, you've found closure and you've had enough and you're going into oblivion, right? There'll be nothing else. Which is, um, it's kind of like um, being suddenly caught off guard because you, you think it's over, right? You, you, if you die thinking, oh, I don't have to face anything, then everything, all the images that come when you die, your life flashing before your eyes, once the body ceases and all the mental activity that continues, usually it's quite chaotic unless you've done some serious meditation, there's going to be a lot of different things coming up. You won't be prepared for that. You're like, wait, I, I thought it was over. What's this? Okay, wait, maybe it'll, maybe it'll end now. Oh, it's not ending. What's going on? And it can be, it's quite overwhelming, right? Your rebirth will be very, you'll be very unprepared for your rebirth. Because you've cultivated negativity, because you've violently sort of disrupted the flow of things. So that's the first thing I would say about suicide. It doesn't fix the problem. It's not a very good solution. The second thing I will say, second of two things, and many of you have heard me say this thing, bef this sort of thing before, but um, suicide is a prime example of engaging in the very perspective of trying to find solutions to problems. Solutions to problems is not the teachings of the Buddha. Now, I'm giving my understanding of the Buddha's teaching, and you probably won't find the Buddha say it exactly like I say it, but based on my study of the Buddha, Buddha's teaching, it's quite clear. Problems and solutions is part of the problem. Our perspective of things, this is a problem, I want to fix it, escape it, you know, or hold on to it, find a way to fix it in place so it doesn't go away. All of this, trying to um, make good, or maintain good re are, are based on reaction, are based on liking, disliking, are based on ego, me and mine. This perspective, I almost want to say ontology, um, but it's more than that. Our way of looking at the world, the way we see things, it's kind of an ontology, it's how, what, what exists, problems and solutions, right? Ontology deals with um, frameworks of existence, what, the way we understand things that exist. So a Buddhist ontology is not that there are problems and we have to fix them. Now, practically speaking, that's how most of us live. Uh, everything is a problem and a solution. It was suicide, there's a problem, I'm depressed, I'm, I'm uh, in, in physical pain or whatever. Physical pain, mental pain, it's usually one or the other. I got to fix it, right? So we take on the perspective that, uh, not in Buddhism, ordinary people take on the perspective that um, there are problems and, and we have to find some way to fix them. And so the the what we fail to see is that the very basis of that is not that there is a problem, it's that there is a thing, in fact an experience, and that's the Buddhist way of understanding it, and we perceive it as a problem. And, and we miss that step, we miss that aspect of it. We say there's a problem. Well, there, no, there's an experience, and you perceive it as a problem. Now, objectively, someone can look and say, oh yeah, that's a problem, and, and, and the, by the way we define problem, we could see it as a problem. But, seeing things as problems is problematic. <laughs> it's, it's, um, it's not a good way to, to see things. Regardless of how you define problem and say there is a problem, there isn't a problem, it's not about what is, it's about your perspective. So, once you have the perspective that something is a problem, you have two choices. Now let's make it simple. We don't realize this. We say there's one choice. You have a problem. I see this as a problem. I see the problem. I have to fix it. Make it so that that thing that you perceive as a problem no longer exists, is, is no longer there. 
right, in some way, shape, or form, or is no longer the way it is, is no longer problematic. The other option um, that the Buddha really pointed out is to change our percep perception. So a Buddhist ontology is not seeing problem, it is really about stopping to see problems and solutions and to start seeing experiences and understanding or perspectives, let's say. The understanding is maybe a good word, the way we understand something. And that's the point. We have the perspective that it's a problem, that's how we understand it. Rather than problems and solutions, there are experiences and understandings. And so understanding is a very, it's the basis of the Buddhist practice. We try and under, really understand things, because our understanding that something's a problem is actually a misunderstanding. It's, or it's a problematic understanding. It's an understanding that leads to suffering for the reasons stated. It, it, it increases negativity, it leads to violent acts, and it ultimately leads to greater suffering in the future. So meditation practice is very much, mindfulness practice is very much about changing the way we look at things so that when there is something that we perceive as a problem, we change the way we perceive it. Um, because seeing things as problems doesn't lead to a better life. It doesn't lead to peace, happiness. It doesn't lead to prosperity. It just leads to greater stress and suffering. Um, it, it's not that, you know, you might think, well, it's easy for you to say my life sucks, you know, I have all these terrible things, I'm in debt, I'm sick, I'm, I have cancer, I'm dying. No, I can't change any of that. We, we, I don't have an answer to fix all of those things, to change your situation. But I can say that much, perhaps all, of the problems that we face in the long term, you know, life after life after life, are based on our reactions, based on our negativity, based on our defilements, our corruptions of mind. Even in this life you can see it. Take a cancer patient, someone who's dying, let's say they're stage four untreatable cancer. Uh, they, they have, well, they have various choices. Let's say one choice they have is to be mindful, and mindfulness will bring them peace. It won't cure their cancer, not likely. I don't know, I think, I think there are perhaps strange, odd cases where cancer is somehow disappears or something through meditation, but I think it's probably very, very rare and, and strange. Um, but for the most part, no, it's not about that. It's that the alternative is to moan and wail and maybe kill yourself. Um, but to be mindful, if you choose to be mindful, you can actually free yourself from the suffering of, of even great pain. Take someone who is, um, who, who is poor, in debt, lost their job and so on. Well, you know, meditation is not going to make it rain gold or, or jewels or money, but it can very well help you see, gain a better perspective, a more objective perspective on your problems. And it can help you organize your mind to, to become more um, capable of getting a job, of educating yourself, of, of finding a way to survive. Um, but ultimately it comes down to the same thing. It, it, the, the very base is it helps you interact with reality in a more peaceful, wholesome, beneficial way. So, I guess a third thing that I would say, and let's just sort of sum this all up, is that people who have suicidal ideation really are just looking at things wrong. You know, it, it's, it's, it sounds trite, it sounds like an easy thing to say, but I would say most people who are, you know, people who commit suicide because of their incapacity to deal with their problems are generally overreacting. 
I mean, I guess you could say they're, they, from a Buddhist perspective, everyone's overreacting. But I mean to say is things like depression, um, even physical pain, are actually not nearly as as uh, problematic as we think they are. You know, it's quite magical how you're able to change your perspective on things so that depression is no longer a problem, anxiety is no longer a problem, fear is no longer a problem. It doesn't mean they don't come up anymore. It means you're able to, in the beginning, see them just as fear, just as anxiety, just as depression. Rather than seeing them as a problem that needs a solution, you see them as an experience and you try to learn to understand them. And when you change that to be your path, everything gets better. Eventually they go away. I mean, it does fix your problems. But because you change your perspective, you stop seeing them as problems. You stop focusing in that way. And you see pain as pain, you see depression as depression. And, and it's... I can say with, from experience that it's, it's quite surprising how, how we amplify our problems, how amplified they are in our minds, where things just seem like there is no way. And then you just switch and suddenly your mind will, oh yeah, it's just, it's just an experience. <laughs> Poof. It's, uh, it's, it's suddenly no longer a problem. You, mindfulness is like water. It just washes it all away, neutralizes everything. So I guess as with everything else, people who have suicidal ideation should practice mindfulness meditation, but it should give a fairly good framework as to why it, uh, it's especially applicable to people who have thoughts of suicide. Don't commit suicide, it's a really dumb idea. <laughs> Um, the last thing I would say, so I, want, I hinted that there was one thing I wanted to say, it's that there's one case where suicide, one way you could think of, no, I don't even want to say that, one example of how one might think that suicide was somehow beneficial. It's a very sort of roundabout way. It's that when you, it's happened, it apparently happened, that a monk tried to kill himself and he slit his throat. He slit his throat and, and died. And then, the, and then they asked the Buddha, they said, oh, where was he born? Must have been in a bad place. And the Buddha said he wasn't reborn. He was an arahant. And it's a very confusing case because people say, oh, wow, arahants can kill themselves. That's not the case. He cut his throat. And then he got so freaked out because he realized he was just an ordinary human being. He hadn't gained anything and that he was going to go to hell. He, as he was dying, all these bad thoughts overcame him and he just, he, well, to some extent he freaked out. But he, you know, more importantly, he pulled himself together as he was dying. And he became enlightened as he was dying. But. The point is, because he saw how bad suicide was, and the only reason he was able to do it is because he'd done quite a bit of meditation in advance. So I think, I, I wanted to add that, I, the only reason I want to add it is because I think people might misunderstand in that way. Some Buddhist meditators might um, read that or, or hear about that or think about that. You know, maybe if I kill myself, I will, um, you know, somehow it will lead to enlightenment or something like that. And it's certainly not the case. It's the exact opposite. Maybe when you start to kill yourself, you'll, you'll, you'll realize what a dumb idea it is, and maybe you'll stop yourself. Hopefully you will. Maybe you won't, and by some chance you've done an intense and, and sufficient amount of cultivation of wholesome states that you will, in the moments of death, be able to become enlightened. But I would say it's, it, the odds are not in your favor and you're much more likely to uh, pass away and, and miss the opportunity to be reborn as a human. I think something, um, just as an addendum, that Buddhists will often say is that you're, you're wasting this precious opportunity. Uh, things like physician-assisted suicide, even potentially, even um, DN, DNR, do not resuscitate orders. Um, not, not because living in a coma without any brain activity is, is of any use, but because you just never know. And uh, so I, I, don't, I don't want to put a, 
a definite statement on things like DNRs and, and that sort of thing, but um, just that we shouldn't take them lightly, and we shouldn't take lightly the human birth, that we have this opportunity now. The Buddha, Buddha's teaching is still here. As long as the Eightfold Noble Path is here, the Buddha said, there will be sotapanna sakatakami anagami arahant. Uh, as long as the bhikkhu, he said, uh, he may cha bhikkhu samma vihareyum. As long as they live, as long as they should live well, practice well. Samma vihareyum. Asunyo loko arahante hiasa. The world will not be devoid of arahants. So it's really just all about practicing well. We have this opportunity. The Buddha's teaching is here, even though the Buddha isn't here. And we shouldn't take it lightly. So that's um, some thoughts on suicide. Thank you all for tuning in and listening. I wish you all the best. <laughs>